a self-forming group who uh, set themselves on time. That's pretty good. Um, we must be in the military. Yeah, welcome, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, to a special Mitchell Institute uh, forum uh, today. Um, uh, I think you know what the subject is all about, uh, the uh, unveiling of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance uh, long-range flight plan for ISR into the future. Now, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force 12 years ago stood up the office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. Uh, and I had the good fortune to be the first one to occupy that position. Two years later, we built an Air Force ISR flight plan, uh, and it, it was a pretty good document, if I say so myself. Uh, <laughs> And a Colonel Dash Jameson at the time uh, were one of the members uh, of the staff that worked on that document. And here we are 10 years later, and now Lieutenant General Dash Jameson uh, and her staff have done magnificent work in putting together, designing, laying out, getting approved through all the wickets, an ISR flight plan for the future. Um, it will take us into an era where capitalizing on the next big thing, that being the seamless uh, and ubiquitous sharing of information, not just information for its own sake, but putting it onto a grid from which everyone will be able to operate, will take us to a next operating paradigm, the notion of building a series of systems where all the services can operate together and achieve combat cloud-like effects. The fusion of information where we'll be able to understand and act ahead of our adversaries. So with that bit of background, I would like to congratulate General Jameson and her staff for doing such a magnificent job. Um, I'll turn it over to them. Uh, to unveil for you what they've been working so hard on, uh, and then we'll make sure that we leave plenty of uh, time for questions and interactions with you all. So with that, General Jameson, over to you. Thank you so much, General Deptula. And I have to say a special thanks to the Mitchell Institute for actually getting us a venue to, to actually have a conversation with all of you. Uh, we're pretty excited about this. We believe the future is now, and we want to we want to have a conversation with you all because our, our next generation ISR flight plan is a classified document. So unless we have conversations and we talk about things and collaborate together, uh, we can't grow and learn from one another. So we're going to try and share with you as much as possible uh, and we'll do some follow-up actions later on this fall at, at a different security level. But uh, we wanted to, to release this and kick it out. With me here uh, is the leadership team of the, of the United States Air Force A2. But more importantly, in the first row over here uh, are our next generation of ISR leaders uh, who actually are the authors of most of the annexes that are in the ISR flight plan. So uh, hopefully at the end of the discussion and Q&A period, we'll still have a few minutes so you can go up and meet them. They, they are uh, Colonel M.K. Haddad, Lieutenant Colonel Smalls Wallace to be, he'll be promoted here shortly. Lieutenant Colonel Snapper Gamble, Lieutenant Colonel Shaq O'Neill, Major Pruitt, and of course, Captain Mike Kanan. There are some others that are in the, uh, in the audience too that were pivotal to writing the annexes. So we're hoping that this sparks a discussion and debate, not just with those of us at this table, but with truly our next generation of ISR leaders. So with that, I, I, to kick off this discussion, you know, I think it really is about two macro questions. Why an ISR next generation flight plan? And really, what's changing in the environment now that drove us to write it at this time? And, and I would start with, you know, why now? We all know that in January, we got a national defense strategy. And in the national defense strategy, it really lays out uh, some of the challenges that we face, a changing environment, and a great power competition that has been started with several, uh, several countries out there. Primarily, 
in the national defense strategy, it says we need to maintain our competitive advantage. And so we took that concept and we evaluated our ISR enterprise. And the second issue really was uh, when I became the A2, and shortly thereafter, the chief of staff of the Air Force, General Golfein, came to me and said, Dash, we've done a review of the ISR enterprise, and while it is doing fantastic in our VEO operations, it really is airman intensive, and it is somewhat focused uh, on today's fight. Are you actually postured for the spectrum of conflict in an environment that we have to plan for for the next 10 years? And so our team gathered together. We did a quick review. And really, we noticed that there are several challenges that our ISR enterprise faced. We really are focused on independent platforms that do single int collection. So it starts off pretty stovepiped. As a result of being stovepiped, when we go to exploit that data, it becomes very linear, very time intensive, and very manpower intensive. When we look at the range of operations that the military is going to have to face, we are exquisite in a permissive environment. Do we actually have capability that can penetrate and persist in a highly contested environment while maintaining our acumen in a VEO permissive environment? Or even, do we have the capability to assist in humanitarian assistance disaster relief operations. So we took that, we took that approach and said, we don't want to just do, quote unquote, a modernization, which is just take what we have and get to the next step. We don't want to just do old think with new tools. We want to be. Uh, we want to be in an environment where we actually think new with new training, tradecraft, and tools in a diverse environment. And so we said, OK, how do we put together a framework for a document or a set of documents that actually gets us to that end? And from there, we actually developed a framework based on two guiding principles. First and foremost, we need a balanced, integrated ISR portfolio. I'm not talking about a leveling of the bubbles. I'm talking about, no kidding, the ability to have very diverse capability where we're not single int focused, but we're multi int focused. We're multi int focused in multi domain. And while we are the Air Force, and we are going to look at what can we do in space, cyberspace, and air. We, we want to be able to tie in with our joint brethren in the ground arena with the Army, in surface and subsurface with our Navy and others. And we want to look at how do we integrate our data flow with the Marines as they are really looking at the human terrain. So we want to look at multi-domain. We want to look at leveling the bubbles and looking at, at a very diverse portfolio. And Mr. Ken Bray is going to talk a little bit more a little later uh, on really some details on, on our approach to that means. The second area we looked at was, you know, um, as the environment gets more complex and as the technologies, and you've seen in the Joint Forces Quarterly that was published this quarter, the chairman wrote about the changing character of war based on disruptive technologies and where that's going to take us. And so we also did an evaluation of how do we ensure that the right hand and the left hand internal in our service is actually talking to each other. And what I mean by that is how do we take our red assessment of what our adversary is doing and knowing all of that and look at what is our operations and our acquisitions looking at? So we looked at standing up a new process in the Air Force called a net assessment process. And General Jim Mars is going to talk a little bit, a little bit more on that topic and give you some examples of how we've kick-started that effort uh, of how do we actually integrate 
right and left hands so that we actually have a full body picture of not just what the adversary is doing, but what we're doing to give us a competitive advantage in the future and not just maintain what we're doing today. So with those thoughts and themes in mind, we actually looked at what are our lines of effort for this framework. And we have three lines of effort. Those lines of effort are first and foremost, disruptive technologies and all that that entails. And when I talk about disruptive technologies, just so we're on the same baseline, really what we're talking about is artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning, human machine teaming, and artificial intelligence. And I talk about it in that manner because industry really knows a lot more about that technology than we do. So we went out and we talked to various icons in industry, and some of you might have, have likened it to what some of the big five data organizations do and how they approach this. And so we went and chatted with them. And first and foremost, they said, we need to get on the same sheet of music and lexicon. Instead of just rattling off what you're meaning when you talk about it, we call that machine intelligence. That's our lexicon in industry to describe artificial intelligence, human machine teaming, deep learning, neural network co computations, and advanced data compu com uh, computing. And we went, well, if it's good enough for industry, it's good enough for us. So we're going to have an annex to kick off the flight plan that describes our priorities and goals for using machine intelligence. The reason is, in the future, we actually have to have decision advantage at the speed of relevance. And when I talk about the speed of relevance, I'm really talking about we have got to have, to our joint warfighters, decision advantage. Because we all know when you, ex when you plan out an operation and a campaign, as soon as you actually go into the operation, the plan gets thrown away and you actually have to have the ability con to conduct the operation based off of intent. That means you actually have to have decision advantage. And you have to be able to make those decisions at the speed of relevance in order to create chaos and confusion inside your adversary's decision cycle and maintain your own decision cycle. And we feel that the ability to do that at speed and scale is underpinned by machine intelligence. Machine intelligence cannot stand alone, though, because there's a lot of standards, there's a lot of processing, there's a lot of formatting that has to actually go into the data to get you to be able to actually use and develop algorithms to fuse the data from the sensors to actually put this together. And so what we did is, in discussion, not just with industry, but with our MAGCOM, our major command airmen, and with our think tanks uh, that we've reached out to and our labs and academia, we thought we actually need to write a data strategy. And you have to write a data strategy that goes along with your machine intelligence strategy so that you actually can develop your standards. So you can access your data, you can transport your data, you can secure your data, and you can actually fuse your data because it's been conditioned and structured to where you can actually use it at the speed of relevance. So with those two in mind, we thought the last thing we need in our disruptive technologies is to work with our AQ brethren and our acquisition professionals. And we did that because, as we all know and we all face, software acquisition is not the same as hardware acquisition. Software acquisition has to be done at the speed of fielding. And if we, if we own Teslas, or we watch Netflix, or we use Uber, or we use Waze, any kind of app, we know that industry already does instantaneous updates. Because if they don't, people go onto another app. Well, we actually have to do that and ensure that our standards are there so that we can actually, at scale, push our updates instantaneously. So though working with our acquisition partners, looking at different ways to prototype and DevOps and different, really different frameworks for how to do acquisition and take advantage of some of the new authorities 
that the Secretary actually has in 804 and 911 will give us an opportunity to look at how do we stru structure um, software acquisition differently. So that's disruptive technologies. And then we thought, you know, we really have to get at the issue. The issue is war fighting. That's what we're here to do, to defend our nation and to win our nation's war in air, land, and space. So for us in the Air Force, we looked at what systems do we have out there and how do we advance them to a new way? And you all would actually take our high altitude annex and, and our other very classified annex that is really a multi-role annex using different kinds of sensors and, and roll it up this way. We have to be able to penetrate, persist, stand off, stand in, have government and commercial capabilities to be able to employ in a kinetic and non-kinetic arena, again, at the speed of relevance. So when we looked at our high altitude and our uh, penetrating and persistent multi-role annexes, we looked at not just taking it to the next step and saying, what's the next thing or pod I'm going to put on an MQ-9? What is the next tape that I'm going to put on RJ? We really want to preserve decision space for those disruptive technologies to come in to enable us to look at autonomous swarming, to be able to assess the ability of diverse set of CubeSats that are DOD or strictly commercial. How are we going to integrate in manned or unmanned capabilities that can fly from 500 feet to 75,000 feet? And what does that provide us? And how do we ensure that decision advantage in five years is preserved that we don't commit too early? And an example I would give you is today. There are over 120 different commercial vendors that are fielding satellite capability that actually is able to mass the Earth in, in, in imagery with three to five meter capability in relative hours the entire globe with over 140 satellites in their various constellations. In the next two to four years, there will be literally tens of thousands of commercial satellites providing electro-optic, infrared, SAR, and, and hyperspectral imagery that will be mapping the globe in minutes available for anyone to purchase. So what I'm talking about is ubiquitous coverage. So how do we take that and include that in our scheme? And how do we program and look at best investments for DOD? So as we transition to what else is out there that's staring us in the face, and I got to thank our members from the press and, and really each one of you, because we're in a network connected globe today. And what I'm talking about is publicly available information, news broadcasts, social media, and other constructs. That typically the intelligence force, and I'll just speak for the Air Force, we really have kind of looked at that askance and maybe used it at end game. And we're going to flip that on its head, and we're going to use publicly available information as a foundational piece of our information. Because when you have literally billions of people tweeting and giving out information, you actually can use that information. You can't use it in a linear analog capability, but if you have a data strategy and you have machine intelligence and you are working with industry on application and algorithm development, the first thing you do is you create algorithms to identify pure data. The reason you do that is because you want to know what's been manipulated and what is not truth, because you have to be able to use truth data. So we're going to incorporate that, and we actually are working today with various industry partners on algorithm development. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. The other thing I do want to talk about is 
literally the operation and the ISR capability for and from space. I talked a little bit about commercial, but we all know space is a contested environment today. And so our ISR enterprise has got to diversify and ensure that we are able to support from an ISR perspective, not just the ground component of space, but also the space component of space. And then as we look at cyberspace, we have to do the exact same thing. We have to be able to affect that man-made domain from space, from air, from ground, from surface and subsurface. And we have to be able to ensure that we support cyberspace within cyberspace and from all the other domains. So we want to preserve decision space and look at disruptive technologies to see how are we going to map out the future and integrate that into our balanced portfolio. And then you kind of get to, well, OK, those seem like wish lists, but how do you actually do that? And it gets to our foundational capabilities. And the last two annexes in our flight plan uh, that comprise the 10 total annexes are, were the hardest ones for us to write. And the absolute most difficult challenge we faced was writing our human capital annex. And I say that because it's how are we going to preserve decision space for how do we assess the airmen of the future? Today, our airmen that we are assessing are digital natives. And portions of the team that wrote our annex are digital natives. That's extremely important. They look at things very differently. They look at things that when they operate in, in the Air Force, it better be the same as what they operate on their smartphone. And they've taken it to a new level. And while we have encumbered them in an analog process where realistically, we all know we use still today PowerPoint and Excel, Excel spreadsheets, that's not how we want to operate in the future. We actually want to operate in a much different visual presentation so that the data is fused and layered. And our airmen who are digital natives already do that. And you've read, hopefully, uh, some articles that we've put out this summer that talk about what our airmen do. And so I'll give you a couple of examples of, of how we are advancing, taking our airmen and, and setting up developmental operations or prototyping arenas throughout our Air Force. Last month, we stood up uh, the first military operational innovation cell in Korea. And we did this because it's been in the news, and we've got to innovate with that really special problem set that our airmen are facing. And what I'm talking about is they are using our, our airborne assets to do collection. In this innovative uh, lab that we've stood up, they actually have taken coders, our ISR airmen, that already know how to code, with our airmen that already understand the processes to work with National Geospatial uh, Agency uh, and our National um, Signals Agency, Security Agency, and they're looking at how do we integrate new process and new think to take the technology to advance, present, and layer the data so that we can employ and fight tonight in a different manner. General Brooks has lauded and encouraged this and is actually going to stand up this month another innovation lab that brings in the UN Joint Warfighting Team to partner so that we can look at this. So we're looking at different tradecraft different skill sets, different way to assess and retain our airmen. Chief Allen is going to talk about that uh, as soon as I wrap up my comments here in a few minutes. And the last thing I want to leave you with is a complete change in lens in how we view our partners. And we all know that we're guilty with our partners. And by partners, I don't just mean the Joint Warfighting Arena, the IC. I'm really talking about our allies and our coalition, our think tanks, academia, and our labs. And, and we've been guilty somewhat of, of constructing a campaign plan. And once we're done, 
inviting others to look and see how they would fit into that plan. That is a shattered old think. In our partnership annex, we are looking at how do we change that paradigm. And the construct that we used really exists in the European theater, and it's, it's called EPI. And what EPI does is it is not a transactional intelligence sharing set of nations that came together. What it actually does is it takes the nation partners and it says, this is the collection capability I have. This is what I want to go after. And I want to form an integrated, coherent, partnered capability where we actually are sharing our processes live as the operation is going so that we actually take best of breed tactic techniques and procedures as we're doing them. Right now, they are using some traditional sensors uh, that are UAVs and, and airborne capabilities, but we're looking at integrating into that capability space-borne assets and cyber assets. And we've taken something from adding them into our campaign to allowing our partners to take the lead, form, and integrate with all of us at the very start. And that is really what our partnership annex is about. So in my final and closing comments, I would leave you with just the first blush of what is this framework? What are we doing? Why are we doing it now? We must affect change. And we have to be able to respond at speed and scale of re readiness to get to decision advantage. And we can't use old think on old tools. We have to use new think on new tools. And to get to those tools is really tough until you actually understand what, what is disruptive technology and how does that integrate in with a, with a data strategy so you can actually use something. And how do you bring along your fourth gen into fifth gen and sixth gen? And how do you partner with the other services with those standards so that as they develop and mature their ongoing systems and new systems with your data strategy, it's seamless and you can fuse the data. No longer will you take a sensor, put it on a target to answer a question. You will seamlessly integrate in the sensors using the data to fuse together and layer it and then look at what did the data show us and what questions should we ask. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Allen to kind of talk a little bit about our airmen and where we're going. Uh, good morning, everybody. Please speak up. Oh, can we just move this? Thank you again, Matt. Uh, so one thing the uh, Next Generation ISR Dominance Flight Plan delivers, and it does this by way of the Human Capital Annex that General Jameson spoke of, it is a pathway to assess, train, and deliver to the MAGCOMs, COCOMs, and CSAs. Still not. Who is on? OK. MAGCOMs, COCOMs, and CSA. Uh, CSA is a uh, ISR Airman of the Future. So ISR Airmen are the key to winning today's wars, and what the ISR Dominance Flight Plan really does is make sure that we are postured well to continue that as we move into the future. Um, airmen must be able to provide decision advantage, and the reason for that is, of course, for that, uh, really for that competitive advantage that you were talking about. We have to be able to maintain that. Uh, to better enable this uh, advantage, we're looking towards more competency-based training, and, and to the left of that, we're even looking towards more competency-based recruitment and assessment in the Air Force. Um, one part of that is uh, some of the methodologies we're using, getting rid of some of those antiquated, archaic, uh, instructional methodologies and moving towards more modern, advanced training methods. And we're doing that, and I'll give some examples in a moment. Uh, but we also must be able to adapt to meet the warfighter's requirements and, and to do all of this at the speed of war, which in really previous training constructs, that's a very difficult thing to do. And we've actually managed to get around some of that and, and integrate very modern, very adaptive training very quickly. And I, again, we'll, we'll give you a couple of examples of that because uh, it's really all about the warfighter's requirements and, and the competitive, competitive advantage that we have to maintain. So um, all this is necessary uh, really to get after that increased lethality and readiness, uh, which is what all this is about uh, in, in the end. So we're already uh, taking steps uh, or foundational, you know, foundational ways or pathways to, to set this in the training realm. And, um, and really what we're doing is we're getting all of our training methodologies aligned with the ISR flight plan so that current courses, future courses, as we build courses of the future, every time we're doing this now, we're going to start integrating some of these methodologies and, and training uh, methods here. So 
Uh, the flight plan chart's an aggressive path. Uh, over the next 10 years, we still have a lot to do, uh, especially on the assessment, recruitment, training, and delivery side. Uh, but to that end, we've leaned forward and we're already taking care of some of this, as I mentioned. And because uh, really we're starting to build our ISR Airmen of the Future or that next generation ISR Airmen today. Uh, one example of this can be found in the Air Force Targeteer. Uh, we've had Targeteers in the Air Force for many, many years. Uh, that capacity has atrophied a little bit in previous decades, uh, but we are going back after it in, in a way that is really unprecedented. Um, we responded very quickly to what the field required, what they stated they needed, and in far less than a year, we were able to not go through the entire training development process that we normally would have to go through, and we immediately integrated very modern, very adaptive training methods, curriculum, instructional, inst uh, additional instructors, into the training pipeline to get after what we had to go after immediately. It's cross-domain, and, and really the training that we're doing now with our targeteers is uh, going to, if not already, increase in lethality and readiness. Uh, we're doing some things there that we've just simply never done before, where we're going well above what you would know as a three level in the Air Force, that initial skills. We're simply going above that and now giving intermediate or advanced training as part of an AFS award and delivering those airmen directly to the field ready to go. So less time and training when they arrive at mission. Uh, also in doing that, we've done something we've never done before where we've really set a network, an enduring, sustainable, repeatable partnership with individuals in the field, specifically 363rd ISR wing, where now the schoolhouse and the MAGCOM and the wing all the way down to unit level have an enduring relationship at that tactical operational level where they can continually feed information back to the schoolhouse to make that training adaptive very, very quick to react to what the field needs. And so far it has been a great success. Uh, so really our goal is here is as the field evolves, we need training to evolve with it. And that's really what we're going after here. We've not always been able to do that so successfully in the past. That's going to change and it already is changing in some respects. Uh, another good example is something that we're doing to the left uh, um, uh, to get after really some of the things that you spoke on, ma'am, on AI, machine learning, kind of that competitive edge in that arena is, if you think about language in the Air Force, it's kind of a cultural issue where we have native speaking and we have kind of that acquisition native, uh, excuse me, acquisition language. Um, and, and that's really how we think about language in the Air Force. But we need to start thinking about language, I think, just a little bit differently because there is machine language now and it is very relevant. The language of ones and zeros, no matter how you bend it and, and, and present it. Um, we have a lot of airmen in the Air Force that have that capacity, have some capability, and we are not tapping into that. So to really go after some of those truly innovative things that we discuss, we have to first identify who has the competency or capability for that. And so one initiative that we're doing, it's a, it's a pretty aggressive initiative, is we are actually going after being able to identify which airmen in ISR to begin with, hopefully this expands, have some type of machine language capability, whether it's an acquisition, formally taught, or self-taught. We need to first identify that, find out how to measure proficiency in that, and then even bigger, and, and really the biggest challenge is going to be how to figure out how to track it, provide that additional training where it's needed, and to incentivize it. And, and that's really what we're gonna go after. Um, and those are all very big challenges. And, and really, um, as we align our training our assessment, our recruitment, our training, our delivery, as we align all of that with the strategic master plan, which is also in line with our Air Force ISR dominance flight plan, is how do we do all that against a, what is it now a currently balanced budget, and how do we refocus that, or a portfolio, if you will. That's all I know. Thanks, Chief. Ladies and gentlemen, now you can see why General Jameson brought Mark onto our team, an incredible <laughs> professional leader and thinker. So the last 30 years of our history have shaped what we have as a portfolio today. Two big events in there, Desert Storm and the lessons learned from that, and more recently is the War on Terror. If you were to look at our portfolio today, it would bin out in three basic groups of capability. One of them is the countering violent extremism. The second is what we call big wing traditional ISR, and the third would be our capabilities that we have for highly contested environment. <coughs> the greatest amount of resources are going towards the traditional big wing ISR. 
Less so for countering violent extremism, less so for our highly contested capabilities. So we took a look at that. We did a red versus blue assessment where we uh, looked at what these capabilities can do versus what we saw out there as, av as available. And General Jameson covered several of the things that we looked at. What we see is that the traditional big wing ISR has been losing its effectiveness over time. And as we look forward and project on the trends, it's going to continue to do so. Well, we're not going to wait for them to become completely ineffective. What this flight plan talks about are the directions to move in order to maintain effectiveness and be the leader in this competition, <coughs> not fall behind. So our review that we did in this red versus blue looked at all the domains and then beyond the domains. As General Jameson talked about, not many people think of publicly available information to be used in this context. We did. So this became the flight plan. These are the options that we're trying to put before the leaders today. What we did with this review is we went to our uh, organizational analysts, the A9, you may know them, and uh, we asked them to team with us and come in and take a look at what we had found and use their analytic techniques because you get to the really sticky question of, okay, how much do we move our resources around and into which areas and how much in each of those areas. So here you've heard somewhat of what we found and I'm going to pick on one vignette because many of these get classified in telling on how we're going to do the secret sauce that General Jameson is talking about. Let's talk about space for just a moment. You heard some of the words. For decades, we've had dozens of satellites. And these satellites are able in peacetime to attribute what our adversaries are doing. However, at the same time, because it's only dozens, our adversaries for decades, if they wanted to go through the effort, have been able to hide from us what it is that they're developing. When you reach hundreds of satellites in space, you break through a glass ceiling and get to capabilities that are very interesting now from space. When you reach thousands in space, now you get to something truly interesting. That's what we saw. That's what we want to bring to this game in what we're recommending in the flight plan, and that's why we asked for some help on what are the insights on how much we move in each direction. However, Space was not the biggest thing we saw. It was the machine intelligence piece. The machine intelligence is going to enable our humans, our sensors, and our platforms. It is going to be the center of what we do, as you have heard. The way it needs to move forward, though, is it needs to be spread entirely across the enterprise. We will move this to the edge, in the sensors, on the platforms, in all domains. To, in order to make sure that we stay ahead. There are key parts of what we do today in a very manual method that automation keeps us ahead in the game and competitive. This doesn't mean we're going to stop in the air. So as you've heard, persistence is still a key attribute that we must maintain. To be able to penetrate is a key attribute we must be able to do, whether it's manned or unmanned. We are going to look at other methods of doing it. Swarms, <coughs> hypersonics, maybe high altitude balloons. We need to do this in order to maintain we're, our effectiveness at the highest levels so we are competitive at the highest levels. So to do this, as General Jameson said, we are teamed with our acquisition community. Our acquisition community community is looking at what can they do to be more agile because we need shorter cycle times. We need to be able to do development and play with what it is that is being developed and stick it into our systems and see what that looks like. We also need them to help us design our infrastructure so that we can do development and operations at the same time. That's a term most of you know as DevOps. DevOps is key to making this work. When you hear that our airmen know how to code and to be able to allow them to work on the mission floor, when the adversary changes a technique or a tactic 
we need to follow with them so they do not get ahead of us in initiative and we can take the initiative back and dominate them. DevOps is critical for our infrastructure. Short cycle times are critical for our infrastructure. The flight plan was signed by the chief and the secretary just a short time ago. When they signed it, they stood up to the flight plan and said, we need you now to take this forward and enter it into the processes, get this into the requirements process, get this into the budgeting process so we can move forward. We will do that informed by our own internal threat analysis. As you heard from General Jameson, uh, General Mars brought to us this threat and net assessment capability. That will become part of what we do. And so to provide more details on that, I'll turn it over to Jim and let him tell you about the coming change. All right, thanks, Ken. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first off, uh, again, a special thanks to the, the Mitchell Institute for, for doing this. I mean, just absolutely a phenomenal partnership and, and I think a, a big example of how we're taking Air Force ISR to the next level. So uh, thanks, sir, for, for that. Um, I am incredibly excited to, to be part of this discussion today because I, I tell you, uh, our A2 team has put together a plan that I think has a clear and direct path to helping me truly what the NDS or the National Defense Strategy lays out as the goals of increasing readiness, uh, creating decision advantage, and securing warfighter lethality. So uh, this was written with that in mind from the start. Uh, Lieutenant General Jameson, Chief Allen, and, and Mr. Bray did a wonderful job of taking you through a number of facets of the plan. And uh, I want to touch on one other very briefly uh, and then turn this back over uh, to, to all of you. And uh, that's to talk about net assessment. And, and that's a topic uh, touched on in the plan and crucial, I think, in uh, the, the role that Air Force ISR is going to play uh, going forward. Um, one of the key themes in the 2018 NDS is the return to great power competition. And the NDS even goes as far as stating that the return of great co power competition caused by an ascending China and a resurgent Russia is the greatest threat to U.S. national security and achieving national security objectives. Um, while the DOD's refocus to peer competition is a stark deviation from the 17-year focus of combating violent extremist organizations, our nation has faced great power competition in the past. And in fact, as part of that great power competition in the past, uh, where we engaged uh, the Soviet Union during the Cold War, the Department of Defense had some key investment decisions to make that hinged on a qualitative and comparative understanding of both our capabilities as well as Soviet capabilities. To achieving this understanding, the DOD leveraged the Office of Net Assessment and its comparative analysis framework to achieve a, arrive at a strategy that ensured the U.S. maintained a competitive advantage in areas where it could outpace the Soviet Union. Today we find ourselves in a similar situation with Russia and China. We must focus our efforts in areas that will allow us to achieve competitive advantage strategically and militarily. Leveraging our past experiences, we will utilize the net assessment process and construct uh, a path to achieving that goal. We build upon a strong net assessment process foundation at the joint level. Our ability to assess blue against red is instrumental in informing choices about future force capabilities and strategy. Uh, I'm fortunate to have had the opportunity as the JCSJ2 to participate in this process, including helping produce the Joint Military Net Assessment, and now have the chance to help the Air Force with similar approaches. Implementing the Net Assessment process will help the Air Force achieve two key tasks. First, it will strengthen planning by identifying focus areas where the Air Force can reasonably expect to achieve competitive advantage. Second, net assessment will help the Air Force maximize investment trades 
by prioritizing Air Force investment in those key areas uncovered by analysis. I'd like to close by echoing Lieutenant General Jameson and thank our airmen in the A2 for the extraordinary work that they've done to shape a flight plan that will literally fuel our ISR competitive advantage for the next decade. I'll now turn it back to General Jameson for the next phase of the program. Well, I think we're to Q&A now. You, you've heard our prepared remarks, but really, this is where we're going to come alive and, and really tease out what, what aspects of this flight plan do you want to talk about? Um, and I'll do the moderating, but before we jump into questions and answers, I, I wanted to let folks know that there, is a, there was a cell phone found in the ladies' restroom so, Snake, make sure you check and see if you got your cell phone. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, questions. Yes, sir. By the way, before, just uh, protocol, let us know where you're from. Right. Uh, thanks. Patrick Tucker with Defense One. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on what you were just talking about in terms of uh, competency-based recruitment, uh, specifically what... Uh, are you looking at in terms of what competencies you want to develop? When does that come into place? What's that change like? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so really what we're going after is at what point in the military and in the Air Force do we give airmen credit as they come into the Air Force, as they decide to join for things that they've already done or expertise that they may already have? Instead of a recruitment system <clears throat> that is focused more on we have to fill certain skill sets or we have to get certain things to a level, if I have got an airman that comes in that has a computer engineering degree or has machine language capability or has some other type of experience, we need to make sure that we're identifying that and that we are purposefully placing that airman in something that where we can take benefit of that, right? We have to take advantage of the intellectual property or intellectual capability that these airmen already have. And we do that to a very small extent now. I think we can do a much better job. At the same time, I also think that we have to get a little bit better on how we assess. Um, there are certain career fields that we bring in where we have maybe one or two tests that kind of give us a baseline assessment on what they may or may not have the um, aptitude for a particular uh, job. Um, those are all pretty old now. So I think we need to maybe take a look at how we can modernize some of that and adapt it to today's airmen to do a better job. Okay. So the primary competency that you're looking to change and begin to recruit for is uh, programming competency. Is that basically what you're saying? There's a number. That is one. Absolutely, sir. Um, also, my language competency airman, uh, my cryptologic language analyst would be another really good example of where we need to refine the process. Okay. The Thank other you. thing I would add to this is what machine intelligence is going to do is remove the airman from actually identifying objects. And what our airmen have to do is critically think. So we actually have to get at assessing airmen that have a proclivity to critically think, not just code, but how do you use a variety of different skill sets? Right now, there's a buzzword called a data scientist. And you know, I, I could give you a dollar for every time I've heard a def different definition. So what we're looking at, and when we, we considered this in writing our human capital annex, we wanted to save some decision space on what kind of skill sets do we need? But more importantly, what kind of trade craft in the future do we need? Because if we have new accessions that can actually get an airman that can critically think, and there are advanced techniques to evaluate that, and you pair that with somebody that is a digital native, that by virtue of playing video games and living in the digital environment, already understands the structure of one and zeros, unlike most of us sitting at this panel, you actually have different trade craft. You actually have a different branding. We don't have a good definition for a data scientist. I would like to think that what we just talked about are the basics for any data scientist. So I don't necessarily need to go hire executives to teach us about what data scientists are. I actually need to open up my mind and see what our airmen already bring and how do we evaluate those, encourage, inspire, and allow them to innovate on their own and develop tradecraft and skill sets that will show us the path to the future. If I may, 
Uh, I think it's also fair to mention that our Air Education and Training Command within the Air Force also recognizes this, and they are going after it fairly aggressively on their end as well, and they're actually empowering us to go after it and change some, some, some of the way we do business as well. So. Um, could you dig into the milestones that are associated with this plan and kind of what you see as the, you know, maybe the lowest hanging fruit in terms of, you know, acquisitions or, or new things that are going to be launched by this? I, I would tell you, I, I wouldn't characterize it as what is the lowest, what is the low hanging fruit because I don't know if you, you, you necessarily want to go after that. I, I think as we do actually have in our classified uh, ISAR flight plan and implementer for every single annex, and our milestones started this year. Um, and uh, as I'm going through, uh, I would tell you t we have already accomplished two milestones. Uh, one in our machine intelligence annex, which was to have our machine intelligence annex be resident in the DOD AI strategy. We checked that box. We were foundational to helping write the DOD AI strategy. When we look at our data strategy, we also wanted to ensure that we work with various CIOs, not just our own, but the DOD, and ensure that the standards and the goals that we are setting up for our infrastructure actually transition and are applicable to others. And we have worked with a working group and a team because our standards are commercial standards. Oh my gosh, what a thought. Uh, we're using some commercial standards so that we can transition data around. So there would be two examples of milestones that we have already achieved. I'll give you another one, and, then, and I'll let my, uh, my teammates here jump in. We really took a look at how did we actually develop some of what everyone in the room knows. And it's called processing, exploitation, and development. And how do we actually look at that? And I'll offer you this. 30 years ago in Desert Storm, some of us, that was our war, I'm going to tell you how this captain handled processing, exploitation, and dissemination for the F-117's employment. We actually put forth a collection strategy. Images were taken. This is awesome. We flew a plane to get that film. And that plane then went and centralized to a classified organization to actually process that film. And they put that film onto sheets of paper. And literally, that book was flown to me in Saudi Arabia so that I could take a look at the images that were taken, so I could take a look at our targeting cycle for the F-117. That was extremely manpower intensive, time intensive. And it really was not at today's speed of relevance, but that was huge back in the day. Post 9-11, we took that construct and we said, we need to have our processing, exploitation, and dissemination, our PED, capability at a much faster pace. Let's establish a reach back capability. And let's take the information from the sensor and put it at a processing capability. We have wings that do that in a reach back mode, and we've distributed that around the globe. And PED has become exquisite with full motion video and high value targeting in our VEO fight. And Every service is using this. And I made a statement, and some of the press picked it up, and I said, PET is dead. As we look at the future, just like we looked at the past, processing exploitation is going to happen on the sensor. It's not going to happen in a centralized hub in a landmass somewhere. It's going to happen on the sensor. And it has to happen on the sensor because I want to be able to create a sensing grid. And that sensing grid is national capability, commercial capability, whether it be satellites, airborne, 
at the tactical edge with frontline fighters or army at the, at the very edge of the battlefield as a sensor or our navy down in the water with acoustics. That sensing creates a sensing grid with the data that the algorithms are going to layer. So the airmen no longer are going to be doing the rote processing and exploitation. They're going to take that layered data that's out there, use different applications, and they're going to have algorithms that get them to ask the questions that the data reveal versus answering a particular task as we did with a single in. So we're going to go from, from that to SIAS sensing, and I've talked about the sensing grid. And then we have to do, as we look at that layer data, we have to identify. We're going to identify different characteristics. A good example is we got to break out the electromagnetic spectrum. We have to identify those characteristics that are affecting our capability. We have to have exquisite geolocation of where that is. So we need to identify that. And we're going to take that sensing grid and that identification because we have to attribute who is actually doing what to us. In tomorrow's fight, and we see this exquisitely in the cyberspace, you really have to go through a, a convoluted path to get at actual attribution. Tomorrow we have to know that at decision speed. And then we have to share that, not just with the joint warfighters, because we'll be doing that, but we also then have to share that with our, clearly, our coalition and partners but with our think, tank, think tanks and academia and, and our national labs to take the science capability to the next level. I'm, not, I'm really not saying do away with PET. I'm saying that's going to be automated. What I'm saying is how we think about PED needs to transition to the future, which is science that gets at the elements at speed and scale of warfighting. And the only way you can do that is with cloud computing. And the only way you get at cloud computing is through your machine intelligence, your data strategy, and your investments. So I hope that that gives you more of a concrete example of where we're headed. Every platform is a part of an ISR strike maneuver sustainment complex. OK. So if, if I could just. Jump in. Add in on that uh, for, for Just second. real quick, if you could make it quick, Jim, so we can get as many questions a in as absolutely. possible. Absolutely. So th this is a plan that was built with implementation in mind, and, and the one thing I wanted to highlight was I, I think the secretaries and the chiefs comfort with especially the, the cutting edge piece on the disruptive side when we talk about machine intelligence and data and those kinds of things as ideas that need to drive the entire Air Force forward. So what this actually sets in motion is a very intense Air Force conversation about how we re-wicker an enterprise with those things in mind. And we do have a joint uh, working group evaluating the SIAS concept and how does it apply not just to us but to all in our community. Very good. Laura? Hi, Lara Seligman with Foreign Policy. Um, you mentioned machine learning and AI and everything the Air Force is doing in this arena, um, but I'm wondering what your plans are to partner with uh, Silicon Valley and the commercial industry, as well as sort of airmen learning to code and learning to do this for themselves. So what, what would you say to the small commercial companies in Silicon Valley, or the big ones, that might want to get in on this, and, and how will you make it easier for them to gain a foothold in well, we actually have held and we will continue to hold Industry Day where we invite in our partners and we give them a framework for their ability to write white papers to give us insights into what their expertise is. But we also have actually in our DevOps prototyping environments, and there's one here in DC, there's one up in Boston, we've stood up an AFWorks and a DIUX to allow our airmen to actually get and have access to our industry partners. While everyone wants to come to seniors to pitch an idea, we're not the digital natives. We're not this first row. We, also, we actually want to give you frontline access to our airmen so that you hear their ideas on what they're already doing so that industry can take that and work with that and iterate with our airmen. We need a combination of old and new 
in, in personnel because we actually can't just have everyone going one off. We have an infrastructure. We have standards. We have to put it on our infrastructure. But we want to partner. We want industry partnering with our airmen because it's their ideas that's going to fuel tomorrow's decision space. And we want that to happen. Ken? I'll add one part to this. Uh, very recently, we actually engaged with acquisition executives as they were looking to sit, put out a new contract. And we said, we really want you to work on how you structure this contract so it attracts the small business. Depending on how you structure a contract, you may inadvertently push them away. So we asked and they agreed with us and they changed the nature of the contract so that it would, there was not a barrier like there normally is for a small business to come <coughs> into the conversation and potentially win a contract. Well, we aren't going to get into specific contracts. Okay, last question, Otto. from Sea Power Magazine. You plan for the future the challenges. One of the future challenges is hypersonic weapons. Okay, yesterday, uh, Mike Griffin at, a, at an AIA uh, session said that one of the keys to the handling of uh, uh, hypersonic both in strike and defense is persistent fast intelligence. Does your plan address what you're going to need to do to handle uh, the threat of, uh, of hypersonics? Absolutely, I would tell you uh, that's not the only thing we're looking at. Uh, we have to have a very diverse ISR portfolio to handle not just ultra fast, but ultra slow. Just as difficult, just as difficult to hypersonic is a very, very, very slow moving autonomous system. The label has been small UAS. Those are very difficult as well. There's new technologies that are out there that you can, can look at the different labs and see as small as an insect capability. So our ISR portfolio has to be diverse enough to handle the ultra fast, the ultra slow, the large, the very small, the entire spectrum. I hope anybody else. Okay, well, Joan Jamison, congratulations to you and your team for a magnificent product, an excellent presentation. Uh, and I know there are a lot of questions out there. Hopefully, you and your team can stick around for a little while and uh, get some of those uh, uh, on a one on one uh, basis. But uh, to adhere to our one hour limit, I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, and appreciate your attention. Thanks very much. So, we have allocated 15 minutes. We begged, borrowed, and stolen about 15 minutes for you to be able to come up and talk to any one of us if you have any additional questions. And uh, in about 15 minutes time frame, we're gonna set out, we have pamphlets, uh, a trifold that is encapsulates all that we talked about uh, in a written format and describes every one of the annexes and where we're headed. And there is actually a picture of the sensing grid in there. There's a picture, uh, a visual of how we're gonna flip PAI and there's also a pictorial on how we're going to change our acquisition strategy. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>